thanks everyone. So we've we've uh, got last maybe one. 30 seconds. The last of the conservation and restoration, and I'm very happy to introduce someone I've known for a very long time. Oh my God. He's he's going to be here the whole rest of the conference, <laughs> bringing you entertainment. Uh, Sean Anderson, and I don't even know what you're talking about, uh, but I'm sure it's going to be interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Sean. Uh, so uh, I'll just start off before we get going to say that uh, uh, when the abstracts were due this year, they're very early, and I was like, I was very depressed as to what was going on, and I was like, I think some bad things are going to happen. I don't know. They're, Anyway, so I, instead of talking about um, some of our other data, I, I just want to talk about what I think is an important thing for us to talk about. I consider you all my family, and I'm worried about some of the things we've been uh, doing, uh, um, how, how we've been behaving at times. So first I just want to say, I'm um, going to talk about uh, management and impacts and things like that. So I have all kinds of folks influencing me, my students, my friends, all you guys. But this, what I'm going to say now are my own opinions, so do not yell at anybody else. You can yell at me, you can be angry or whatever, but these are my opinions, even though I've benefited from so many discussions with all of you guys. Okay, when it comes to talking about a lot of our environmental impact stuff, a lot of our management, um, it's always um, a challenge. It's always a challenge, it's always been a challenge. Management is a constant negotiation. It's always, there's always trade-offs in the best of times, and it's a hard thing to do, and things are getting crazier uh, by the moment. Many of us that are coming from a more theoretical or basic world, we, we like to look at the world that we want, and and uh, and and maybe we don't always inhibit uh, or, or inhabit the world that we have. When we do management, we need to live in the real world, and so that real world is messy. It's got a beast of many heads. Uh, it always has, and it's getting more more um, diverse. Um, a, a very tempestuous time we're in, and many of the institutions that we rely upon are under stress in big bad ways. So for example, as we're getting on the plane right here, the vice president was conceding as over 200 homes were burning um, next to our university um, because of clearly climate change intensified uh, winds. So this stuff is the world we have. We have to make some decisions now. Um, WSN has been fantastic about helping us climb down from our high horse. Um, we, we often give you guys ladders and all these kinds of great things. It's awesome. And for 30 years, I've been going to things. Uh, you know, hey, this is how you talk to people. This is how you can engage in policy. And that is to our credit. That is to your credit. So you guys should engage when engage with advocacy and all that good stuff. But sometimes that advocacy can lead us to maybe not the best place. So when we do, when we do engage uh, with uh, managers, etc., um, objectivity and advocacy do not have to be in opposition. Um, uh, we need to be mindful of our impartiality, though, and, and be objective. Um, when we do engage in advocacy, there's a risk of, of our trust being eroded, right? Depending on when we work with different communities, et cetera. So that's just, that's just uh, part, of the, part of the world. So um, a quick observation, this doesn't, you guys don't know this, you don't need this, but, but we have a lot of challenges these days. We can throw a thousand slides up, biodiversity crisis, et cetera. Then we have like a-holes like this coming on. <laughs> And so one quick example. So the first, first example I want to talk about is deep sea mining. So um, it's been crazy how groupthink our community has been on this deep sea mining thing. It's ridiculous. So let me tell you about a couple things that are going on with this. So climate change, we all know this is, this is, the, this is the real thing we're trying to deal with. So um, electric vehicles um, are one part of our decarbonized um, uh, society. We need to, we need to decarbonize. Um, but they're a nice poster child and, and, and they're a convenient target. This is what we're using right now on the left for our um, uh, the batteries, et cetera, to power these electric vehicles. If we just follow our policy guidelines around the world, we need a lot more um, rare earth elements, et cetera. And if we get to real sustainability, we're talking orders of magnitude more material. We just need that. Recycling is going to get us there. We need, and we need to make this transition quickly. Right now, the business as usual is killing people in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It is destroying um, huge amounts of rainforest in Indonesia. That is where your iPhone and computer and stuff is coming from right now, right? So business as usual is just more and more and more of this. Um, there's all kinds of hidden socioeconomic impacts that people don't talk about. Surface mining is horrible. So one possible solution is deep sea mining. There's many different types of deep sea mining. I'm just going to talk briefly about polymetallic nodules. Um, they have all kinds of uh, uh, metals that are valuable here to help with this transition. 
Um, now, normally in our intro bio classes, we hear about this kind of stuff, uh, diatom depositions and these sort of sedimentary fields that are enriched with different kinds of critters, which is cool. I never heard about these things. These are adsorption fields that are in different pockets around the world. And here, instead of stuff falling out of, you know, settling down from the water column or, or dead critters, this is stuff that's actually coming straight out of solution. They look like this, they don't normally look like this. This is a super insanely dense one, but just to sort of illustrate the point, they're fields of rocks, basically, right? Um, these are what they look like in my lab. So this is, oh, they're almost all um, uh, crystallized around a shark tooth. Um, so these, so this, these guys are anywhere between a, a couple hundred thousand years and million years, sort of in age. So these are essentially a non-renewable resource. Um, but basically, it's all sand and metals. You don't need to use acid leachate, you don't need to do anything like that. You can basically just heat them up and the metals essentially come apart. Um, we have a whole international framework for, and this is in international waters, for um, uh, who can mine it and all this kind of stuff, which we can talk about later. Suffice it to say, that international agreement, the, the Convention on the Law of the Sea, that the US helped negotiate, we're one of the few countries in the world that has not signed it, but um, that's another story. Um, so uh, anyway, so we have a framework within that convention that 167 countries have signed to fairly divvy up these resources. So it's not the rich country goes in and steals everything and takes it all. Um, but then also, just as we, we as marine biologists, we are interested in impact. We want to know the impacts of the things we're doing. So there's several reasons that we've been working on this for some time. It's been over 30 years and we don't yet have the, the criteria for the best way to go mining and stuff. And it's just taking a long time. One of those countries, Nauru, um, it essentially triggered the, um, triggered the uh, 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 criterion to actually start to go mine. So like, hey, it's been taking so long. They did that in 2021, which started a two-year clock, at the, the end of which, um, theoretically, they could start to go mine, basically. Um, when that happened, everybody freaked out. So at the time, a lot of people were saying, and, and in fact, a lot of these environmental advocacy groups and everybody said, hey, we should have a science-informed decision matrix to figure out if this is good, bad, or what the impacts were, that kind of stuff. And everybody agreed. Then when this happened, the world changed. Suddenly, it became a huge political campaign to shut this stuff down. And um, this was absolutely a political campaign. Um, so we started, see, we started seeing uh, papers published that say things like, it's going to test the question, um, uh, calls for moratoria, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so there are real impacts, and, and we need to be serious about these. There are real impacts. One of them is sediment, uh, sediment either kicked up at the bottom or sucked up and then sort of distributed in the water column. Real, real, you know, worries about what, what's that going to do. Um, unfortunately, the initial concern was the kind of stuff, you know, uh, I mean, better than me, but it's like back of the, back of the envelope sort of napkin estimation. Because back in the day, we didn't have any, we didn't have good data, right? So this is kind of tracer type studies, right? This is like, what if we kicked up sediment? How far could it go? And so you saw these absolutely huge estimates, hundreds of uh, uh, kilometers, thousands of kilometers of impacts, and this was gonna destroy all this swath of the, the benthos, and it's, oh my God, we can't do this. And everybody keeps quoting that. The metals company, which is the company that, that's the farthest ahead of all these different companies around the world that are working on this, um, uh, has been working on this. They've paid so far about $60 million for the impact assessments and trying to figure stuff out on their own. Um, again, not required by the convention, but they, they're trying to set standards that other companies, particularly China, would have to uphold to this. Um, in any event, the first benthic uh, uh, tester went down a, a bit over a year ago, drove in the bottom, you know, did it physically work, but then also let's make some impact and then let's see if we can see what it does, right? So then nine months later, went back, and so this is pre-mining, um, pre, uh, uh, and this is post, and you can see, um, so here the, the tread, the, the track, and um, again, the worry was sediment was gonna be everywhere, it was gonna kill everything. Oh my God, that guy's still alive. A couple centimeters outside the track, nine months later, this guy's alive. This glass sponge, which is this guy, um, is still alive. Just a, a couple meters from this supposedly end of the world sediment kicking up. Um, so that's, that's crazy, right? I should be able to show you a graph with a couple hundred data points to show you the, the pre and post. I can't, because we only have about 12 images because Greenpeace boarded the boat and shut down the data collection intentionally. So, um, so this, was, this was not a mining operation, this was an environmental monitoring uh, expedition. They boarded it, fell in the ocean, had to be rescued, um, all this kind of stuff. But suffice to say, 
this was considered a victory, and we're shutting down the bad, evil company. This was us trying to understand what our impacts were, and so we don't have data. And so this is exactly the technique that um, oil and gas is used, it's exactly the technique that, that um, tobacco is used. You say you want data, and then you do everything you can to undermine the data, don't fund it, obscure the, the analysis, all that kind of stuff, so it's a problem. So that's one example. Another one, thank you. Another one is this. So you might have heard of this dark oxygen paper. So one is, is let's like not have data to actually talk about impacts. The second is, let's obfuscate. So this is a paper that came out this uh, summer, um, uh, and it basically said, oh my God, these deep sea nodules are producing oxygen. And so therefore, you got quotes from some of the authors by saying things like, um, uh, we, we can't deplete the, o the ocean of oxygen. It's like, what? You know, it, it's crazy. Um, <laughs> It was baloney. So there's four separate labs around the world who've written critiques that are in review right now of this paper, including being evaluated for a retraction, the paper, um, in Nature. So it includes all kinds of problems, including chambers where there weren't nodules. So the idea was we, we put these chambers, put them down, put some nodules in, and saw oxygen evolve was the idea. Oh my god. But when you actually look at it, chambers didn't have, didn't have nodules in them. Um, there's all kinds of problems. The PhD student that was doing her work alongside didn't report the same thing. The lead author was let go from his university for ethical concerns. There was all kinds of problems with this. Nevertheless, this paper is incredibly highly cited. It's one of the most cited papers now ever. It's 880 out of 27,000 or 27 million papers um, in altmetric. And and so like, what's going on here? Why did this get published? It was a political act. I think. So it was right when we were having a vote for the new head of the ISA. So this was released in time right before um, the vote, essentially. So, so um, this is what's going on. And, and, and it's important, you know, of course you should publish papers and we should talk about stuff, but it's really concerning to me that we were not having active science data-informed discussions about a lot of this stuff. And it's very much character assassination and innuendo and all that kind of stuff. Another quick example, just another quick one before we have to I get kicked off here. Is um, so one is we have to we have to you know take real data. The other one is we have to be honest with our assumptions. And so this is some work that we've been doing with out of kind mitigation. Um, and uh, what is out of kind mitigation? Out of kind mitigation is when. And I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm um, so so uh, traditional restoration, you know, the kind we all like, the kind I like, is we destroy a wetland, we make a wetland. So that would be in kind. I, I lost the resource, I'm making more of that resource. Increasingly, though, in our world, because of climate change and other things, we can't always do that. So the classic example would be a beach that's lost because of sea level rise, and we just don't ha can't get the beach back. So that's out of kind. Now, in kind has all kinds of great policy guidance, et cetera, we've been developing for decades, which is really helpful. But when we get to the stage of out of kind, it becomes hard. How, like, we don't, it, what do we replace? If we can't put a beach here, what, what are we going to put in place of a beach, for example? Um, and it is also coming under attack. So this is then Secretary Zinke talking about compensatory uh, mitigation. He says it's un-American, all this kind of stuff. So people are, again, like, whoa, 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 we're the scientists, we're supposed to be sitting here properly uh, evaluating everything. So out of kind, and then also we hear a lot from um, some folks in certain circles that um, they're uncomfortable about out of kind. No one would support it, and this is weird, and whatever. So let's take a look. So this is, these are some surveys from the last two years, a little bit less than 2,000. Uh, randomly encountered people from a, across uh, Southern California. And we asked them, hey, so is it okay to convert one ecosystem into another? And uh, most people say no, about 60% of people say no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't do, you know, convert system one to system two. But there's a consistent about one in five people say, hey, maybe, sometimes. And, and what might be the trigger? Most people think that um, if we have to do this, we listen, want to listen to the scientists. So, so about, 85% of people say yes. So if a scientist says this is a good thing to do, maybe it's a species range shift, something of that nature, um, we could do that. But also, there's a significant um, support for social reasons, for other reasons, because of logistics, because of funding, something like that. So there is room for us to have conversations about this stuff. And we ask, <clears throat> the last one I'll say, and then I'll shut up, is um, we can also ask people where we should do a, a restoration or a mitigation, let's say. For us in WSN, most of the talks for decades have been, you know, watershed, small scale, local. We want to preserve our genetic diversity, right? Which makes total sense. I agree with that. Um, and when we ask the public, 
Um, so watershed region, this would be about you know, roughly our sort of small you know, genetic uh, makeup area. Um, that's about 26% of people say we should only do out-of-kind mitigation in a nearby area. Um, and that's about the same as the people that say there shouldn't be any limit. They say we should go the other side of the state or this or that. Um, and then lastly, um, we really need to check our assumptions. So this is that same data, but expressed with Calen virus screen data. This is a, a metric we have in California for looking at vulnerability, um, communities, uh, uh, communities that are more exposed to pollution, um, et cetera. And so the higher we go here, the more disadvantaged we get. And what we see is this, is this is how far away can we do a restoration? It turns out that most of us that are in, that, that are, that are um, that most, most people kind of think it's, it's one level that we can be fairly far, but the wealthiest community, the most stable community, and I, I hazard to guess that many of those are our communities, um, think very differently. And so it's important when we're, when we're doing these things to one, uh, you know, honor the data, respect the data, but also to check ourselves. What, what are the assumptions we're bringing to these, these challenges uh, with? And so, so I'm out of time, but I'll just say, uh, the deep sea stuff, be really careful of bandwagons, really, really read the data. Um, for out of kind mitigation, we need to check our assumptions. And then for all of you, it's okay to engage. We want you to engage. You guys should engage. Engage, engage with, with these challenges. But we just want to make sure that we're engaging as really respectable scientists that are coming from defensible places. And with that, I'll be quiet. Thank you. <laughs>